Good morning, everybody. I'm going to try and do another video. I'm trying to hold the phone. It's backwards, but I'm trying to hold it where you can, uh, you know, see me. I know when I look at the video later, it looks like I got it the right way, but as long as you can hear. <coughs> Went to H-E-B the other day. These are just, these morning, I got up at 3, and it's 10 after 5. And uh, it's just good. I'm going to use the time. I'm going to do some, post some stuff. These videos are going up either the day I make them or the next day. So I could cover some world events too. Uh, for those of you that follow that, I'll do a little bit of that. <laughs> Our, uh, we decided not to raise interest rates. <laughs> Janice Yellen, they're going to hold off on raising interest rates. And I think the stocks went up just a little bit. The old days, they would have went up a whole lot, but that that policy that uh, that the Federal Reserve does for like six or seven years, keeping interest rates uh, almost at zero, very low, that's considered by some economists as very dangerous for many reasons, and <coughs> there's a lot of uh, the the sign that they're not raising interest rates means that things are not well in the economy. And normally that means the investors understand that, oh, there's going to be more, you know, free money that gets pumped into the system. And that's kind of a card game to me. And I think ultimately just non-political view that uh, we're going to have to go through another, another clearing out that the system has to balance and you can't and in a microcosm and in a small image that's exactly what's happening with Greece and the Greece bailout talks that are still going to collapse again it, it, you can uh, systems and societies you can only live on credit for so long you just can't keep doing that and there's a, a certain amount of credit that nations governments people that can live on that could be considered good uh good debt if my house here is paid off mortgages are considered you know acceptable because instead of paying a thousand a month rent if you're paying a thousand a month for a house payment that's acceptable debt in my view some some financial guys don't think that but it's okay to have that type but if you had everything on your credit card and everything and you over thing and my card's maxed out I'm hoping we're gonna fix some of that but when countries economies do that you you have to it can't keep being done and so that's a little bit of happen uh, our country just announced US just announced that we're gonna start we're gonna have heavy artillery in some of those NATO uh, states right around Russia they're afraid of Russian aggression because of Ukraine so we're gonna have heavy artillery tanks and all and we're gonna the plan is they're gonna be there and if anything goes wrong Russia begins a big invasion to the whole region we can get NATO troops in on the ground I heard the leader of NATO I forget his name now who it is now secretary general guy but he looked scared he was make he was talking yesterday he was scared in his speaking, but uh, uh, Russia responded that they're going to think another 40-something uh, nuclear warheads, uh, rockets with capability. That just was announced the last few days. And I don't see any of these as conspiratorial. I just see that the system is, uh, things are playing out. That's all. Things are playing out. And we should not be ignorant that these things are playing out like that. Um, these talks are like, you see me, I guess they go for about 30 minutes. And you just see, uh, you can have a scheduled thing. I read last night. I watched uh, one of my favorite uh, teachers, but I won't mention his name, but he's a scholarly guy. And it was interesting because uh, I figured every, I study a lot throughout the day. I'm active, as you see me doing things with pops and all. But I do a certain amount of reading, a certain amount uh, throughout the whole day uh, at certain set times, as well as the activities you see. 
And that night I try to catch between about 4.30 or from 5 to 6. I try to watch some type of scholarly show. Something that's not just a preaching show, but something good. And it might be a documentary on Greek history, Roman history, things that would uh, help me in the things that I'm teaching. So I watched one of the guys last night, a scholarly guy. And he said something that was interesting. It was very good, about 30-minute talk he gave. And he said, uh, Jesus quoted from the book of Deuteronomy a lot. When In the ministry of Jesus, he quoted a lot from the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. And he said, and Deuteronomy chapter 8, which I'm somewhat familiar with. I've read all the Bible many times through. He said, in Deuteronomy 8, he said, is such a key chapter. He said, because when Satan tempted Jesus, Jesus gave three quotes. I'm familiar with the quotes. Uh, Man shall not live by bread alone. You shall not tempt the Lord thy God. And there's the other one that he said, uh, Worship the Lord thy God, and him only will you serve. And the, the teacher, preacher said, and all of those, he said, are in Deuteronomy chapter 8. And he said, therefore, you know, it should be a very important chapter. And then he went on and spoke about that chapter. And I decided all oh, that'll be one of the chapters I'll read. And I didn't read it to check him up to see if he was correct. But as I read it, I was going to look for those three, and I found... Man shall not live by bread alone. And then when I finished the chapter, it didn't have the other two. And I didn't read it to critique him. And I would still recommend it. And you say, well, how could something like that happen? Everybody. I, I watched the, uh, oh, this is about a year ago. But there was one of the, the guy that's in charge of one of the security agencies for the U.S. government. This was interesting. It was a documentary show, but they had actual footage. And it was about a certain thing, uh, a certain uh, right of uh, privacy, or I forget what it was, that the Constitution says you can't do something. And, you know, they asked him, it, it forgot what it was, and he said to Congress, he was talking to Congress, and he said, obviously in my position as a, you know, top security person for the U.S. government, I'm very familiar with that uh, constitutional clause. And certainly, you know, uh, uh, it doesn't say that, you know. And the Senate hearing he was at, it was about seven or ten people, they believed him that, oh, I guess the Constitution doesn't say that. And then in that documentary, it showed you the clause of the Constitution that said that thing, that he said that that didn't say. It wasn't a big thing, but the Senate hearing, they also accepted it. And all you had to do was read it. And so in this case of the teacher, he might have heard that Deuteronomy 8, but he read it too, but he might have heard it. The other two quotes are in Deuteronomy 6. Uh, you worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve, and you will not tempt the Lord thy God. But I read the chapter, so I could discuss a little on the chapter. God brings the people through. Moses is telling them, God brought you through all of this, through the wilderness, to test your hearts, to see if you would do what is right, obey his law or not. And right at the end, I got a little different when I read it. God was saying, I allowed it all. Oh, and God says, I permitted these things to happen to you. Uh, so, to humble you so you would know your heart. And he read a quote, the preacher read a quote from Thomas Aquinas, and I liked it. I, I wouldn't be able to give the whole quote. But what I was also seeing the other day I mentioned, I said there were a couple of cases of famous preachers the last few years. One was a black preacher, and it seems as if he might have been having sex with some of the younger kids in his congregation, very famous preacher. Not that they were minors, but maybe like 20, 19, and something was going on, and it came, came public. Then there was an out-of-court settlement. Nobody ever knew. The ministry kept going. It seemed like probably some of that did happen, but there was no open 
whether did it happen, was it repentance? It was just settled sort of in that way. And I was saying on one of the videos, and it was windy, I don't know if you heard me, but Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. He wasn't saying, he wasn't saying beware of their teaching, though he was, that's part of it, but he was saying beware of what their, the thing that's got them hooked, which was the double life, the hypocrisy, wanting to have the praise of men, to be involved in things just for the image. And, that, and at the end of the trials of the 40 years, uh, applying that to our lives, maybe God, throughout your life, in a lot of these preacher situations, maybe God's saying, I wanted to deal with things. And then, when things are dealt with, do you lie? Or are you honest? Are you honest? Or do you lie? And if, at the end of these scandals that took place, if some of the famous people figured, somehow I'll have to cover this up, in order to continue my ministry for the last 10 years, and I know people that have been involved with things, then if you lie, cover up at the end, then you didn't pass the test because all you did was fell for that living of the Pharisees because you lived the rest of your life. It'll be between you and God, but you live the rest of your life in that hypocrisy, that living of the Pharisees because you gave a certain image that was different. The areas of these false accusations that people have made, uh, in the case of some of these people I'm working with, I've met the family now of the son. I've not met the son yet, but the son, the story has gone around. I've not looked for that story. It's come up a few times, but the uh, ex-wife, uh, she didn't want to get the divorce from the husband, and she had her 10-year-old accuse him of molesting her, and he got convicted, did 10 years, child, uh, he's got the sex offense status, and now the daughter's 21, and this is the family, this is the mother that owns these apartments where Pops lives. I talked to one of the other daughters yesterday, she was just wanting to talk to me. Uh, she's having struggles with alcohol, and the daughter's going around saying, Mom made me lie. And the mom works here in Corpus Christi. You, you might have thought, well, what she did, she also destroyed her daughter in a sense because it's a very selfish thing if that's true, if what happened is true and that was the thing that the mom made her say. So all of those things follow us. All of those things follow us. I was reading the prodigal son uh, last night too. I read a little bit of Timothy. The parables of Jesus, Jesus told that story, and it's, it's interesting in the parables. A lot of the parables, the theme in the parables is sort of like this. We've been doing right all our lives, and all of a sudden, these other people that have been doing wrong all of their lives, they're going to get just as much blessings as we're going to get. I don't think that's fair. A lot of the parables are like that. What Jesus is doing in those parables, he's preparing the Jewish community for the acceptance of the Gentiles coming into the kingdom of God. That's what those parables are about. A lot of them are about that. And it would be their righteous indignation of the people that had God's law were doing God's will for all these years, had the covenant, had the work, and it would be very offensive to them for God to then say, oh, and see all these Gentiles, these non-Jews, who you, the outcasts of society, and, and, and God says, now I'm accepting them. That was a major stumbling block in the Jewish mind. Paul writes about that in the book of Romans. So many of the parables, that's the context. It's important to understand them from that context. The prodigal son, that's the main thing Jesus is teaching, even though he's also teaching God's uh, mercy and compassion to receive us. And the prodigal son is a story. I read it uh, last night, I think, or the night before. But a man had two sons, and 
the one younger son says, I want all of my inheritance now. And in the tradition of the Jewish families, you couldn't just give the inheritance to the younger one. If you were going to do that, the older and the younger uh, both had to get it. The inheritance had to be given. And so the younger boy takes it and he goes off and he wastes all his money, the Bible says, on riotous living. And he winds up uh, working for some man, taking care of the pigs, and he's eating the food that the swine were eating. He's, he's gotten to that low point in his life. And he says, look at what's happened to me. He says, I'll, I'll rise, I'll go back to my father's house, and I'll tell my father, I have sinned, I've done wrong, I, look what I've done. And he goes back to his father's house. And before he even has a chance to say anything, the father sees him and receives him and has compassion on him and makes this big party and puts a robe on him and a ring on his finger and kills the fatted calf. And it's just this wonderful party of God saying, I forgive you. I accept you. You don't have to come back as, you know, some type of a servant. He was willing to just come back. Dad, let me be a servant says, no, you're my son, I accept you, I embrace you. And there's a lot of theological things there, too, because it says in Galatians, uh, when you're under the law stage, you're as a servant. But now that the fullness of time has come, we are now sons. And so the oldest son, who never left, who also got the inheritance, the oldest son comes back, and he's coming to the house, and he hears this big party going on. And he asks, what is this? I, I hear something. You know, what's going on? Would we have a big banquet I was unaware of? They said, oh, no, your younger brother has come back. And your father's made this wonderful feast for him. And he's just having such a great time. And the older brother says, he never did that for me. This, this son who's been away, He's not served you. He's wasted everything. And you're accepting him. That's, see now, that he was preparing the Jewish people to receive these others that would be coming in that didn't serve God, that were considered outcasts of society. He was saying to that right self-righteousness, you need to be willing to accept these others. Jesus said, the whole don't need a physician. The people that are healthy don't need one, but the sick I have not come to call the righteous, but I've come to call sinners to repentance. So the father sees that the oldest son is having this struggle. And he says, what's wrong? And he says, you never did this for me. And the father says, everything I've always had is yours. It's, uh, but this, your son, he was lost, he's found. He was dead. And he's come back. So we should rejoice over that. That's what Jesus was uh, dealing with, and he does that in the other parables. <laughs> God wants us uh, repentance as you get to the end of it. You know, I'm clean. I'm clean, and the biggest thing to be clean of all the addictions, people. I've found, I've seen that. It, it the, the root of it. A lot of my friends that are in recovery, and they are hooked on adultery, porn, lust. It drives them. It drives them. You say, oh, John's talking about me. A lot. Of, I have a lot of people all over that don't even, that fit these things. I read a thing in Jeremiah one day, and sometimes the Bible, if you read carefully, you realize it's, some of the language is sexual connotation. It says, as a, as a husband rejoices over his bride, so God rejoices over you. You're just saying, John, a sexual thing. It's comparing this act of love rejoices over his bride, and it's saying, but the spiritual love and communion we have with God is actually greater than that act. And the marriage act, which the act of sex, lovemaking in marriage, which is considered a sanctified holy thing, the scripture uses that in different ways. But I'm reading also Jeremiah the prophet. I'm maybe at j chapter 17. I'm reading through New Testament, through the prophets, through Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Gospels, a little bit, the Psalms, Proverbs, all through. 
I have a regular system of reading through. But it was in Jeremiah, I forget which one, one or two, two early chapters. And it's pretty graphic, it says, as animals when they are in heat have a one-track mind. You know, when you're hunting, I used to deer hunt, you know, you see an animal in heat. Normally the animals are very, you know, weary, oh, we're going to get shot some. But when they're in heat, they, they don't see a danger. they just got a one-track mind. The scripture said, Jeremiah said, my people are like that. <laughs> when you're driven, when you're driven by pleasure, and even if that pleasure is considered a God-ordained thing in marriage, Paul said, I would, that everyone would be like me. What he said was non-married and celibate. He said, but if you can't contain, let everyone have his own wife. It's kind of a tough thing. Jesus said, some are born eunuchs, some are made eunuchs. Some decide to... That's a, that, that's a calling in scripture that a lot of the modern church uh, doesn't. A lot of single people, even in the Protestant churches, who are called to a life of singleness and celibacy, the Protestant church has done a very bad job of letting them see the biblical side of that calling. The Protestant church is normally focused a lot, especially the modern churches, relationships, marriage, and it, it's almost never seen that that's an actual biblical calling to be celibate to live in purity, in body and soul and mind. And these terms are used. These terms are used in Scripture. And even some of the other people that for many years, even they still deal with those issues. Some of the verses that came up, Jesus said, the light of the body is the eye. If your eye is evil, your whole body is full of darkness. But if your eye is single, it's full of light. There, there are aspects of our lives where God, Jesus said, whoever commits sin is the servant of sin. It controls you. So in our lives, without getting into all these other things, repentance is, we, i got a verse written out here I, on my outside. <laughs> I don't know if you can see it here. Might, I get the light on. i got a lot of them out here. It's early out. It's from Job. My righteousness I hold fast. I will not let it go. My heart will not reproach me for as long as I'm there. Uh, so God's calling us to lives. These are open talks I'm having. Time is it? About 22 minutes. These are open talks I'm having in the morning. I should show you a couple of funny things. I'm notorious for lighting things. Oh, did I tell you the story? I, I went to H-E-B. Look at my little stuff. Now, if my wife sees this, she'll be very upset because I almost burnt something down one day. One day, GB, and I don't think I'm unreasonable, but I'll let you guys judge this. And this was the other day, and I'm fast. I shop fast. You know, I could go and get everything in 15 minutes. HEB's a grocery store in Texas. So my wife, as we go in, I was going to get whatever. I don't think she was going to get anything. She was going to look for something. And she says, well, I'll meet you outside. So, honey, are you telling on your wife? No, I just want to give these real-life stories. So I got my stuff in about 20 minutes, tops, 15 minutes. I don't get, ever get a card. I get the little basket. Even if i got to fill it up to the top, I can move fast like that. Efficiency. So I check out. And I, there's a little bunch bench, and I'm going to go smoke outside. And, but I make sure I sit there for about 15, 20 minutes. I said, well, she said, I thought she was going to be right outside as soon as I was done. So I figured, let me find the car. And I'm very bad at finding the cars. And I'm all dressed in black with my black glasses. I have two sets of clothes. You either see me. I got a lot of black pants and black shirts. It's not always the same ones. So I walk to the car, find the car, and i uh, I'll make sure she's not in the car, no. Go back to the bench. Then I go inside, looking around, and I'm getting a little mad, so I tell the security guy in there, I said, look, I got my receipt. I'm not stealing anything in here. <laughs> I'm looking for my wife. Can't find her. Okay. Go 
go back out to the bench. I said, oh, I, and I'm the type, like, after a while, I'll just get on the bus or something. I'll stop walking. But I figured, no, I'll be patient. Look at my little flame. <laughs> so I go back to the bench, smoke a couple more cigarettes, and I'm like, this is something that's got to be wrong. Go back in the store. I still couldn't find it. And it's a smaller H-E-B. It's not the one that's the big one where I live. So... I walk back to the car. At this time, the renter cops, the security cops, some of them are all cops. I don't think these guys are real cops doing off duty job. He must have seen me walking back and forth to the car. You know, this guy's dressed in black. So I walk back to the car. You know, big guy on one of those bikes right next to the car. <laughs> so I figured out, oh, he must have seen me. They're checking me out and he's just sitting there. And I tell him, I said, it's my car. He's like, okay. I said, I don't want you messing with this car. Yeah, I don't want you messing with it. I said, I, you know, look, you know, I kept a little perturbed. I got every right, it's my car. I said, I don't want you stealing nothing out of this car. I'm here to protect this car. He got all huffy, rode off on his little bike. Go ahead and go get another job, brother. I was just, so it was kind of like funny. Hey, I was in my ride. He looks suspicious to me. So I go, finally, I see, I find my wife, and she sees I'm upset. I never look at the time of the receipt when you check out. But I looked, I got in the car. It was one hour since I checked out. That was all right. Everything settled. I thought it was funny. I like things. This I just made. Normally, I don't have something this. My wife used to catch candles. This is like one of my little torches. I just set that one up yesterday, actually. It's a little, the flame's a little too big, I admit it. But I make my own little candles. But one time my wife used to find candles lit. I would never leave something like that big lit. But she'd always find things lit. And she would tell me, I got old torches in my yard. I like lighting stuff. And she, you're going to burn the house down one day. One day I was in my yard praying, early like this. And I had one of those little torches on a chair different chair but it was a chair and I'm on the other side of the house praying in the dark I see fire so I think well, what happened I lit the chair that was next to the house on fire it was you know I'm a retired firefighter so I just grabbed my guard nose and I was laughing a little bit but it the chair was on fire and it started burning the bottom of the house <laughs> it, was, it started burning I fixed it but it started burning the bottom of the house so I painted it, you know, cleaned it up during the day. And I turned the chair around where the whole side of the chair is burnt, but it, the way I had it, you couldn't see. And then maybe two months later, I came home one day to my wife. What happened to that chair in the yard? Oh, <laughs> she must have found it. So anyway, surely your sins will find you out. I want to bless you guys. I think we did 30 minutes. The prodigal son, he got to the point where he was in the eating pig slop and said uh, he recognized and the father accepted him. And so when you hear me talking about these issues, I have friends that I'm not judging friends. God's desire is for us to get pure. Okay, His desire is for us to get free. And the beginning process of freedom is something's got a hold of you if it does. And then you start. But when you justify, I've had friends over the years, I had people tell me they justified sleeping around, uh, picking up prostitutes, Christian friends. So how could they, these are guys that have maybe been on the streets for years, finally got off of certain things. Oh, John's talking about, look, I got friends in New York, okay? So it's not just you guys that are in Texas, he's saying me. Wake up, everything's not about you. So the thing is, don't justify if you got a struggle, then you, then you begin walking towards purity. It's a big issue in Scripture. God's merciful, but you got to be like that kid that said, look at where I'm at. Then God begins a process. All right, I'm going to upload this later. Hope you enjoy these quick videos. God bless you all. <laughs>